The streets of Philadelphia hadn't seen this level of violence since the American Revolution. An unstable economy fueled anger at recent immigrants. Fights in the public schools boiled over into the streets. Young men with few resources and even fewer job prospects split into factions that ruled the neighborhoods. Long-standing divisions in society cast their shadow over the city, bringing battle in the streets. We're talking about Philadelphia and the decades leading up to the Civil War, when the city as we know it was born. This is Found in Philadelphia, a podcast dedicated to telling the stories of Philadelphia's past so that we can better understand the present because our history matters. I'm your host, Lori Almond. With each episode, I hope that you'll learn something new, see things a little differently, and be inspired to go discover some of this history for yourself right here in the city of brotherly love. This is the sixth episode in a series about the history of Philadelphia's streets. It's our modern city's origin story, and a major incentive for its formation was to take back control of the streets. This episode is closely related to the previous episode about changes to the city in the 1830s and 40s, so definitely give that one a listen. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please let me know. You can rate and review the podcast or drop me a note at foundinphiladelphia.com or on Instagram at foundinphiladelphia. Thanks for listening. First, let's take a quick look at Philadelphia in the 1840s and 50s. For the first 150 years, Philadelphia was a crowded, crescent-shaped settlement, clamoring to be close by the bustling trade along the docks of the Delaware River. But by the 1840s, things were starting to change. Buildings rapidly filled in the blocks to the west of the crescent, reaching all the way to the Schuylkill River by the 1850s. Development was also spilling over the boundaries of the old city, which was then just the two square miles we call Center City today. The grid of city streets reached beyond the northern limit of Vine Street into Spring Garden and pushed past the southern boundary of South Street in Moya Mensing. All of this building was needed to house an exploding population. The number of people living in the region would more than double in the decades leading up to the Civil War. Philadelphia and its river wards were home to 225,000 people in 1840. The population grew to 388,000 in 1850 and would hit over half a million before the Civil War in 1860. Where were all of these people coming from? Well, some people from the countryside moved to Philadelphia in search of jobs, but most of the population boom in the city was fueled by immigration. People fleeing from revolution in Germany, poor Catholics uprooted by political oppression and famine in Ireland, The makeup of city residents changed. It went from one in 10 residents being foreign born to one in three people having been born abroad. During these years, Philadelphia also provided a refuge for a significant free black population. An increasing number of people came to the city to escape from slavery just to the south. As the city grew, the number of African-Americans kept pace, always making up between seven to 10% of city residents. I know that doesn't sound like a lot compared to today, when black residents make up over 40% of our city. But at a time in our nation when slavery was still legal, Philadelphia had the largest population of black people outside of the slave states. And while the city was far from being a welcoming place, Philly's concentrated community of free black people was incredibly important. So Philadelphia was growing and changing rapidly, but not equally. The cobblestone streets in this period ran through a city of substantial brick row homes, some fitted out with running water and gas. Streets also squeezed through unpaved and unlit back alleys of wood shacks, where a dozen or more people shared an outhouse. Homes stood next to small factories, schools opened near coal yards, churches rose close by warehouses, and stables were everywhere to shelter the city's army of horses. It was an era of incredible growth and change, but also stark inequality and deep resentment. And this proved to be a deadly mix. Much of the violence of this period came from a population pushed to the edge in unstable times. 
Many people who were struggling were concentrated in certain neighborhoods. And these areas were human tinderboxes, ready to ignite. A series of economic recessions, followed by a major depression in 1837, hit the Philadelphia region hard. It's estimated that 25 to 40 percent of men were out of work. There was no safety net, so when work fell short and the grocer would no longer extend you credit, your family was in real danger of starving. The poor and hard-hit working class found themselves struggling on the fringes of the city. They could only afford housing in the least desirable neighborhoods just across the city line in places like Kensington and Moyamensing. There was a lawless feeling in these fast-growing neighborhoods. People were arriving from all over, many escaping from desperate conditions. Families were disrupted. Young men lived unsupervised in overcrowded boarding houses. They were free to roam the streets at night, where there were few patrols. Neither the city nor these outlying areas had anything like a modern police force. In Kensington, for example, there were only five constables for a population of over 20,000 people. In the absence of any sort of law enforcement, the streets were controlled by gangs who marked fences in their territories with names like the Schuylkill Rangers, the Rats, and the Blood Tubs. And the street gangs were loosely tied to the neighborhood volunteer fire departments, which were sort of like social clubs for the white working class men of the city who no longer identified with a craft. The volunteer fire departments united around religion, ethnicity, or political affiliation, but there was no organization between them. Here's our guide to the history of the streets, urban historian Michael Kahn from Stanford University. Those fire companies, they were pretty rowdy groups, some of them. And if they were racing to a fire, you know, and they got there at the same time, they could start to battle each other more than the fire. The firemen saw themselves as protecting their streets, but not just from fire. They used the threat of violence from the street gangs to regulate who lived in the neighborhood, who walked there, and who socialized at their taverns. These men were rarely, if ever, charged in court for their violent behavior. Judges treated them leniently. It would take decades for the city to reform the volunteer fire departments and create a professional firefighting force. And it was into these rough, dirty, crowded fringes of the city that the newly arriving Black and Irish Catholic residents were forced to settle. Though they did move into back alleys throughout the city, many of them clustered together in these outlying areas. The majority of the growing Black population settled to the south of Center City in the area bordering Moyamensing. The Irish Catholic immigrants also moved into the southern districts of Moyamensing, but also into South Wark. They also settled to the north of the city in Kensington. While Philadelphia as a whole saw its number of residents double, these areas outside Center City were seeing their populations quadruple over the same period. Both groups often lived in incredibly crowded and foul conditions. They drank polluted water and suffered from epidemics of cholera. Despite this, these neighborhoods did provide a sense of community, of safety in numbers. In these dark times, the rising numbers of Irish Catholic immigrants and Black people were seen as a threat. These groups were set apart, one group by religion, the other by skin color, and both were mostly uneducated and desperately poor. They were seen as bringing down wages and taking jobs and resources away from those who rightfully deserved them. So Irish Catholics and African Americans were pushed to the margins of society where they competed with each other for the least desirable jobs and places to live. We need to remember that, however bad their situation, Irish Catholics were treated differently than the Black population. The Irish were considered to be white and therefore eligible to be citizens with rights, while the Black population had no rights to speak of. Their status was precarious in a country where slavery was still practiced less than 30 miles away in Delaware. And as we'll see, Irish Catholics were victims of violence, but they also participated in attacks on the Black community. But even while they fought each other, both the Irish and the African-American groups would be blamed for dragging the country down during an incredibly divisive time 
which would ultimately lead to a civil war. And both groups would be the targets of violence in the streets. So perhaps it wasn't surprising that the raging violence of the period began in the racially mixed streets of Moyamensing. And it all started at a firehouse. One of the earliest riots raged in the hot, sticky days of August 1834. This was before the major depression of 1837, but during a brief economic recession, and the tensions between white and black workers was ready to ignite. The first sparks flew when a group of young black men attacked members of the Fairmount Engine Company in the Northern Spring Garden District and stole some of their equipment. This was a pretty provocative act and was likely brought on by insults that were never recorded. In retaliation, the following day, a group of 50 or 60 white men beat up the sons of Philadelphia's most successful black businessman, James Fortin. But this was just a warm up. On the next night, August 12th, hundreds of young white men descended on South Street. They gathered outside the large wooden shed of an amusement hall at the edge of the city that housed the Flying Horse. This was an early flying swing ride that was popular with young men, both white and black. Telling each other that some of the black men who would attack the engine house were there, the white mob destroyed the Flying Horse and tore down its shed. Then they turned south where they knew the black community lived in the crowded streets of Moyamensing. For three nights, mobs of reportedly four to 500 young white men terrorized the neighborhood. Many in the mob were low-skilled laborers, including many Irish who lived nearby. They started by tearing up the street to weaponize it. Cobblestones called street apples were pulled up and hurled through the air smashing through glass and wood doors. Wood posts that supported sidewalk awnings were ripped out to use as bats. Now armed, they destroyed black churches and homes and beat up any black person they could find. Most of the black residents fled. It was only on the third night that the sheriff in the city managed to pull together a civilian posse and a militia unit to try and restore order. In the end, one black man was killed Many more were injured, and even more had their homes ravaged. And only 10 of the 60 men arrested ever appeared in court, and not one was fined, jailed, or punished for the riot. Unfortunately, this was just the beginning. The economic devastation that followed the Panic of 1837 only increased the existing racial tensions many more vicious anti-Black riots flared in Philadelphia. Young white men found some provocation to turn their frustrations into days-long attacks on the Black community. In the desperate days of the Depression in 1838, mobs targeted the newly built Pennsylvania Hall. The hall had been built by the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society, and in May, a shocking meeting was taking place there where men and women, both black and white, were attending. A mob assembled outside and began smashing windows. Members linked arms and escaped with their lives. The following night, the mob returned and set the building on fire. The volunteer fire companies reportedly looked on without making any effort to stop the destruction. The next day, the mob attacked an orphanage for black children. On the third, they damaged the Mother Bethel Church on 6th Street. Four years later, in August 1842, the Black residents of Moyamensing were terrorized again after a Black temperance group publicly celebrated the anniversary of the emancipation of the enslaved in the British West Indies. About a thousand young men marched down Lombard Street, walking in formation with a fife and drum band, carrying a flag showing an enslaved man breaking free of his chains. When confronted by a group of white men, the Black men dared to fight back. This moment unleashed days of violence against the Black community. Another abolitionist meeting hall and a Black church were destroyed. Black residents were again forced to flee the city. Mobs surrounded the home of Robert Purvis, the multiracial leader of both the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society and the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee. He was well known for helping enslaved people escape to freedom. Purvis faced the mob with a shotgun. 
an Irish Catholic priest, Father Patrick Moriarty, came running to stop the mob and avoid bloodshed. As a recognized leader to many in the crowd, Moriarty's speech managed to calm the situation. But the widespread violence didn't stop until the sheriff called in 1,000 armed militia troops. The Black community later tried to get damages for their destroyed property, which the city failed to protect. But the judge ruled that the young Black men were at fault for marching in the streets in the first place, inciting the white mob by, quote, presuming to use public space. I wish we could move on from this depressing story of violence in the streets, but there's more, much more. The violence was only going to intensify as the mob's anger turned on the Irish Catholic community. In the 1840s, anti-Catholic feelings were boiling over. The tide of Irish Catholic immigrants was growing every year and indeed wouldn't peak until 1850. The Catholic diocese in Philadelphia increased fivefold from 1840 to 1850. This flood of Catholic immigration was seen as a threat to the Protestant way of life in the United States. This fear fueled a political movement that called itself nativist, which I've always found confusing. But in this era, a quote, Native American meant a white Protestant person who was born on American soil, not foreign born. American Indians were conveniently forgotten in this bit of branding, as were all people of color and people of other faiths who had been living here for generations. The poorly named nativists concentrated their anger against the foreign-born Irish Catholics. When they burned effigies of Irishmen in the street, the message was pretty clear. Nativist rage against Irish Catholics was about to ignite over what was being taught to their children in school. First of all, it's important to remember that free public school for all was a relatively new thing, and the Irish were seen as being a burden on this new publicly funded resource. Protestant working class parents were forced to share their schools with the growing numbers of Irish Catholics. And then there was the divisive issue of religion in schools. The Pennsylvania public school controllers warned against introducing religious instruction in schools, But in practice, most schools in Philadelphia had students lead Bible readings each day. The problem, of course, was which Bible? In Protestant America, the Bible meant the King James Version, plain and simple, and that's what was used in schools. But Irish Catholics worshiped with the Douay version of the Bible. The Douay Bible was thought to be a more authentic translation for Catholics. When you consider that it was once a crime to have a Douay Bible in Ireland, you can understand its significance. Catholics were upset that public schools made their children read from the King James Bible, which they considered against their religion. As a compromise, they proposed that Catholic students be allowed to leave during religious instruction. But in districts with large Irish Catholic populations, this was so disruptive that the teachers stopped reading the Bible altogether. According to a contemporary letter to the editor, Protestants were incensed. Not only were these foreigners overtaxing public schools, now they wanted to rip out and trample on their Protestant Bible. This fight over Bibles in public schools fed into the fears and anger about Catholic immigrants and increased the popularity of the nativist party. Nativists began rallying large crowds to their cause. During the 1840s, as we've seen, arson was becoming a common threat in Philadelphia. So political parties began staging their events outdoors in the street. The nativists decided to use these street rallies to deliberately provoke the Irish Catholic community to violence. And then they could turn around and declare how vicious and depraved these people were. Unfortunately, these tactics worked all too well. In May, 1844, the nativists gathered to hold a political meeting in the heavily Irish Catholic streets of Kensington, north of the city center. Young Irish men, mostly in the late teens to early 20s, rose up and took the bait. They broke up the meeting, hurling cobblestones and swinging bats, and brought down the nativist speaker. But things got out of hand. Guns were drawn, and a young nativist was killed. The shots were believed to have been fired from the Irish Hibernia Hose Company. The nativists now had a martyr to rally round. 
What followed was not so much a riot as all-out street warfare. The Irish Catholic community was the target of days of violence. Thousands of nativists marched in procession from Independence Square to the streets of Kensington. Everyone knew they were coming. The sheriff in Philadelphia could only get one constable in Kensington to report for duty, and he didn't have many volunteers to form a civilian posse against such a large mob. The nativists first targeted the Hibernia Hose Company and then went on to attack Irish homes, first destroying them by hand and then setting them on fire. That was when the shooting started. The Irish Catholics knew the neighborhood and used guerrilla-style tactics, sniping at the nativists from alleys, houses, stables, rooftops, before disappearing and reappearing somewhere new. The fire spread through the many wood-framed houses in the neighborhood. The hose company was destroyed and there was no one to fight the fire. Residents fled from their burning homes only to encounter bullets in the streets. Militia troops finally got organized and arrived to allow other hose companies to put out the fires. But they were spread too thin, and the next day, the churches of St. Michael's and St. Augustine's were ransacked and burned to the ground. St. Augustine's was the church of Father Patrick Moriarty, the Catholic priest who had stopped the mob from attacking Robert Purvis's home two years earlier. More militia troops were called up to protect other Catholic churches, and crowds were warned that the militia now had orders to shoot into crowds to restore order. For two weeks, Philadelphia was under martial law, with more militia troops pouring in from Harrisburg, and even soldiers and Marines called in from the U.S. Navy Yard. A famous early photograph from 1844 shows a crowd gathered outside the First Bank of the United States, then called the Girard Bank, on Third Street where the militia units were headquartered during this violence. In Kensington, it's estimated that 200 families were displaced after the fires. Hundreds of them camped out in the woods and fields just to the north, living like vagrants. In contrast, the nativist party was on the rise. July 4, 1844, saw the nativists out in strength. With thousands on parade with banners reading, beware of foreign influence, and signs bearing the Protestant symbol of an open Bible. On July 5th, a day after their triumphant festivities, nativists descended on St. Philip Neri Church in Southwark. They'd heard a rumor that there was a stash of weapons in the church basement. This was the flashpoint for four days of deadly chaos. The sheriff raised a civilian posse to help restore order. The civilians wore white badges on their hats reading, Peace Police but it was otherwise impossible to distinguish them from the nativist mob. In the end, in an effort to clear the streets around St. Philip Neri Church, the militia troops, armed and on horseback, fired directly into the crowd. They allowed the mob to pick up the fallen, and then they moved their cannon into position. But by then, the street had cleared. On the following morning, a reporter described this scene, quote, window shutters, doors, fronts of houses, trees, tree boxes, awning posts, lamp posts, pumps, watch boxes, signs, are all pierced with balls and shot, and the pavements, gutters, streets, steps, and door jams stained with blood. It would take several more days and an influx of militia troops to bring things under control. These events in Philadelphia were deeply shocking to the nation. The destruction of churches by a mob? Militia troops firing into a civilian crowd? In the city of brotherly love? So this was Philadelphia in the 1840s, an explosive city bursting at the seams, gut-punched by an economic depression, with its marginalized communities of poor white men, Black refugees and Irish Catholic immigrants all tearing up the streets and turning on each other. With state militia troops regularly called in to restore order. But there was a new layer of danger coming to the streets of Philadelphia in the 1850s. The shadow of slavery was growing longer and deeper in the years leading up to the Civil War. Philadelphia, with the largest concentration of Black people outside of the South, was deeply affected. 
The new danger was brought on by the passage of the Federal Fugitive Slave Act in 1850. At the state level, for decades, Pennsylvania had been passing legislation that protected fugitives from being returned to slavery. But the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was designed to end these state protections for good, forcing Northern states to uphold slavery on their streets and enacting stiff penalties for anyone caught helping a fugitive. With the passage of this law, no fugitive would be truly safe until they were out of the country. Freedom was farther away and life on the streets was increasingly dangerous for black people in Philadelphia. It was now very easy to legally seize a black person in Philly, whether you were a fugitive or not. A slave owner just had to claim that someone was a runaway and that was enough to get you arrested. One young man was seized at Poplar and Ridge Avenue on his way to work. A mother with five young children was taken from her home at Fifth and Germantown. Another young man was accused of stealing chickens at Second and Lombard, but was seized as a fugitive instead and marched at gunpoint to jail. But Philadelphia was also key to the resistance. The city was a critical hub within a shadowy regional network known as the Underground Railroad. Philadelphia and its free Black community were an important communication center, assisting runaways escaping from slavery in the South. And we have an extraordinary account of this network in the records of Philadelphia activist William Still. William Still was the corresponding secretary of the Vigilance Committee in Philadelphia, and his mother had run away from slavery herself. The Vigilance Committee was one of those groups formed to protect the Black community against kidnappings, which we heard about in an earlier episode. Robert Purvis, whose home was attacked by a mob, was the committee's chairman. These committees became even more necessary after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Much of the work of the Underground Railroad was clandestine, especially since a large part of Philadelphia's white population was not sympathetic to the Black community, if not actively pro-slavery. The Vigilance Committee helped the fugitives from slavery with a place to rest, food, clothing, and medicine, and then they coordinated passage to new homes and jobs in Canada. But some of the Vigilance Committee's work was very public and played out in Philadelphia's streets. The committee's most public work was when they offered legal help to people who were arrested and accused of having escaped from slavery. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 made the federal government responsible for returning enslaved people if they escaped to the North. Often the federal government returned people without any legal hearing, but the Vigilance Committee included white abolitionists who would sue to have the case heard in court. So in Philadelphia in the 1850s, if the alleged fugitives' appeals to being seized were heard at all, they were heard at the U.S. District Court, which was housed in the second floor of Independence Hall from 1850 to 1854. During the trial, crowds would gather outside on Chestnut Street and in Independence Square to hear the latest news. Sometimes the alleged fugitive would be released, but others would be legally sent into slavery. This made the release of the accused, when it happened, that much sweeter. The mother and her five children I mentioned earlier, the Williams family, were one of the lucky ones. Williams, and by extension her children, were claimed as the property of a man who stated that she had run away 22 years ago. After some very clever testimony by the Black witnesses, the judge threw out the case and set Williams free. The joyous crowds gathered outside Independence Hall and formed an impromptu parade. Williams and her children were taken up in a carriage and driven to the office of the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society at Fifth and Arch, and then on to the Institute for Colored Youth at Seventh and Lombard, where the Black community had gathered in large numbers. Speeches were made to the crowds on Lombard Street. When it was finally time to take Williams and her family home, the horses were removed, ropes were tied to the body of the carriage, and as many hands as possible pulled them home under their own power. Several hundred people followed the carriage home to Fifth and Germantown, cheering them on and singing songs. By the 1850s, the city of Philadelphia was at a crisis point. The horrific levels of violence seen in the streets had really blown Philadelphia's reputation to shreds. 
Much of the rioting was taking place in the overcrowded districts just beyond the city lines, outside of its jurisdiction. It took days to mobilize any force that was even remotely effective. Here's historian Michael Kahn. The upper classes of Philadelphia are watching this with a growing sense of apprehension in the 1840s. So if you were a kind of well-off merchant and you lived in Philadelphia or you had your business in Philadelphia, you might be getting nervous about this violence that's taking place, much of it in these surrounding towns that you and the people of Philadelphia can't really do anything about. There was momentum building for consolidating Philadelphia County into one single municipality to create the city boundaries that we know today. In fact, people had been talking about consolidation since the nativist violence of 1844. A group of concerned businessmen met that year to push for consolidation. There was a fear that the rioting in areas outside of the city limits were threatening the future prosperity of Philadelphia. Incorporating the outlying areas just made economic sense for the city. The two square miles of the old city limits claimed over 120,000 residents in 1850, but for the first time, twice as many people, over 280,000, lived in the greater Philadelphia County outside of the city center. The financial panics of the 1820s and 1830s had decimated the city's financial institutions, leaving the city dependent on its manufacturing centers, and many of these were inconveniently located outside of the old city's boundaries. They were weaving cloth in Germantown and Maniunk, shipping coal from wharves in Port Richmond, and building steam engines in Spring Garden. Wealthier citizens argued that the expanded city would capture all of this manufacturing and provide a much bigger tax base, which would boost funding for capital projects. By subduing the riotous outlying districts, they believed they could build more beautiful and orderly city streets. Other, more progressive thinkers envisioned a consolidated city where the working class would find a broader base to support needed reforms. But both groups feared that the warring factions and neighborhood gangs could tear the city apart. They agreed that the city and the outlying districts were, like the nation, stronger together. Here's Michael Kahn again. The kind of city fathers, and it, it was fathers at that time, would have been quite concerned about this. And so they start to adopt a couple of measures to try to control this this public violence. And, and I think you could say to try to control the streets. So they start a process of consolidating the city and creating a unified single urban entity in place of these 30 different little jurisdictions. And so they uh, succeed in 1854 in creating the Consolidated City of Philadelphia. The Consolidation of Philadelphia in 1854 created the boundaries of the city as we know it today. But it didn't immediately create the modern city with centralized infrastructure and unified public services. The Consolidated City remained both a physical and legal patchwork made from existing elements that were stitched together into a new whole. It stubbornly clung to old ways of doing things, even as it took up the new ways. One of the truly new creations of the consolidated city was the police. Philadelphia's new police force reported directly to the mayor and were one of the first centralized citywide changes that people could see every day on the street. We're so used to living in a city with police that it's worth taking a look at how things worked before consolidation. In the evening, a small night watch force was still in place at the time of consolidation. For example, the city had only 106 part-time night watchmen to patrol the two square miles of the old city at night. And then the outlying districts, as we saw, each had their own even smaller force. For wrongdoing during the day, the city relied on its citizens to police themselves. There was a small decentralized system for dealing with lawbreakers. Citizens who were wronged turned to their local alderman's office, which acted as a third party to resolve disputes. The aldermen typically were well known in the neighborhood, often rising out of the working classes who lived there. The majority of civil and criminal prosecutions started at the alderman's office, 
First, a citizen entered the alderman's office and made clear their grievances and paid a fee. Constables who were attached to the alderman's court would then be dispatched to serve a summons or an arrest warrant to the defendant. Then the two parties would meet back at the alderman's office to either resolve the issue or set a date to meet in court for an additional fee, of course. Not surprisingly, the fee system made prosecution popular among the aldermen. Higher fees were paid for cases that went to court than for those that were resolved in the alderman's office. And some aldermen dropped cases because they thought that the parties in the case wouldn't be able to pay. The whole system gave the average citizen the power to proclaim their grievances against a fellow citizen, but it was also rife for abuse. And apart from the corruption, the alderman's court system was completely incapable of stopping a riot. So following the violence in Philadelphia in the 1840s, some residents were actually in favor of the city maintaining its own standing militia. Others strongly objected to having a military force in the city firing on civilians, and instead proposed a compromise. Philly would have a civil police force, like the one they had in London. The Metropolitan Police of London was established by Robert Peel in 1829. England's police force was something new. It fell somewhere in between being a military organization like the militias and a civilian force of night watchmen. Unlike a military force, Peel's police were much cheaper to maintain. They caused less resentment in city residents, and they were entirely under the control of city government. The newly consolidated city of Philadelphia created its own version of a civilian police force with over 800 men who patrolled the city's 14 new ward divisions. This was a major change. Philadelphia became a policed city, and police authority was felt most on the streets. The police were different from the night watchmen in that they were organized under a strict centralized chain of command, like the military, to improve communication. Unlike the old alderman's court system, the police served directly under the mayor and no longer worked under the decentralized court system. From the beginning in Philadelphia, this set the police and the courts apart, which has led to some bad blood between the two. One of the most distinctive features of the new police force was their uniforms. They were the first civil officials to wear a uniform that made them readily identifiable to the public on the street. Remember the chaos during the nativist riots when the civilian posse members wore a white peace police badge as their only form of identity. The uniforms were new and hugely unpopular with the early policemen. At this point in time, only soldiers or servants wore uniforms, not your average working man. But the city hoped that the sight of a police uniform on the street would help deter crime. The police were now meant to be an active force who would patrol the streets to not only find crime, but to prevent it. But almost from the beginning, the police were doing all kinds of other things. They took on a whole variety of tasks to keep the streets clean and safe. They enforced sanitation and nuisance laws. They returned lost children to their families. They gave the homeless a place to stay at night, though this was often done using force. They even shot stray dogs. The police were out on the streets and were most likely to see the issues that affected people there. Depending on your perspective, the police were seen as a welcome force for orderly streets. Others saw them as a politically corrupt department that misused its power to harass the most vulnerable people on the streets. Either way you looked at it, the police were something completely new. This new police force was an important part of taking back control of Philadelphia's streets. In fact, the way the streets worked was about to get a major overhaul. But before we can get to that story, the city will witness another war, which we'll talk about in the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Found in Philadelphia podcast. If you're enjoying this series, please drop me a review and share the podcast with a friend. And please check out the podcast website to learn more, see some period images, and find a list of my sources. This podcast was researched, written, hosted, and recorded by me, Lori Ahmed. Surreal Tayendi is my amazing audio engineer who leads the Community Recording Collective at Drexel University. 